the land you have now, that's all you get. They're not making any more new land. <laughs> It's a tough business, especially for a black farmer. Black farmers, they were not treated fairly. I know of a lot of the black farmers in our area that had really decent sized farms. They opted to sell it and get out of it. I worked for the bank for 20 years. So if you're gonna talk about a problem, they would always say, follow the money. <laughs> government-funded programs have been available for white farmers and not for black farmers. It's very easy to lose in this game. <laughs> if people lost their land, it went back to the banks, and then the banks used that to start building subdivisions and all kinds of fancy projects, and the land was gone. As we've seen over the years, the black farmland has basically deteriorated. There's not as many black farmers who own land anymore. I've always lived on this, on this property. I was born and raised right over there. <laughs> My grandparents were sharecroppers. They didn't own their own land. They lived with a white farmer. Basically, they were providing labor and everything to help get the crop in. They didn't really share in the profits, and they wanted to be able to do it for themselves. My grandmother, she was reading in the paper. There was a program, a FSA program, that farmers could purchase land. My grandfather couldn't read, and she read it to him, and he was just kind of thinking, uh, we can't afford to do that, you know, and we're not in a position to do that. We're sharecroppers and, you know, and so forth. So she just said, well, we can go and apply and see. And that's what they did. They went and applied, and they were very blessed in being able to get the approval. My father used to tell me there were three types of people, and that was, A, those that don't know what's happening, those that are waiting for something to happen, and those that make things happen. So, I tried to stay in category number three if I can. <laughs> Back in the fall of 2020, we had had all these contentious elections and the pandemic was going on. I was angry and I was tired of being angry and I knew I needed something positive. The chair of our environmental justice group had heard about this idea about possibly having these farm to church CSAs. People were enthusiastic about it and it felt like people were intrigued by the idea of getting local produce that was fresh every single week delivered to the church. It felt like something tangible that we could do to invest in the community and to promote justice and equality and sustainability. I sent out a couple of emails and I was hoping to get, you know, five to 10 people and I got like 60 responses. So I said, well, I think this is something that people would be interested in. CSAs came from the black farmers. They couldn't penetrate the white markets. So they would grow things and then they would sell among themselves. So that's kind of where the concept of, of, of community supported agriculture came from. It caters more to the small guys than it does the big conglomerates. It kind of guarantees you have somewhere to sell your produce and, and that you're going to get a reasonable, decent price for it. Let's see, get her list out. We sell shares. In other words, everybody that's a, a member of this CSA, they share in everything that all the farmers grow. Every time I leave on my van, Everything in there has already been paid for. Before we even put a seed in the ground, a lot of times we've already been paid for it. From the beginning, we talked about relationship building in addition to the produce. And I think that's probably, from my perspective, one of our biggest successes. Now, if there's a rainstorm, I'm thinking about the, the crops. And if there's a drought, I'm thinking, oh my golly, you know, I hope our crops are okay. 
God commands us to be good stewards of the earth and its resources and to build relationships in the community. Relationships that are just and equitable and relationships that lift one another up. Theologically, it's like right in line with everything we say we believe. I love church people. <laughs> they realize that they can make a difference and they're making a difference and I'm making a difference here. So we're all making a difference in the right direction. And lo and behold, it's a lot more fun. <laughs> Now, this one is CSAs right. allow us to invest in the community and to create relationships and to be good stewards of the land, which is what God has called us to do. Having the support of Rafi really made this project successful. Potatoes is oh, yeah. six. I don't know if we could have done it on our own as just a yes. single church with this vision, but having this partner in the community who's already connected with farmers and doing really good justice work I think ensured that the project was successful. You get to partner with other churches as well, so you're not only partnering with farmers, but you're creating a network of churches in your area that care about food justice and equity. The CSA model has been uh, almost a godsend to us. My grandchildren, my great-grandchildren will have something that they can look at and look at, look at what my grandparents did or my great-grandparents did. I've been very happy with the program.